Good on you, Jared. Great show. In fact, fiery show. Hello, welcome along to On the Couch. What a weekend of footy it was to kickstart 2016. In fact, History May show, round one 2016, as a watershed round, a round where I thought we may well have got our game back. Long kicks, big goals, big marks. In fact, I was in Perth yesterday, as I welcome you boys, and I thought to myself, are we going to see another century goal kicker with Josh Kennedy doing a magnificent performance? So, Kingy, you were BOG last weekend. Uh, you're under the microscope tonight. Are we? Well, that's, uh, we'll, we'll keep our eye on that, Jared. The youth was what I loved. These young kids coming in, first, first game opportunities for them. They handled themselves so well. Just gives great hope to those clubs going forward. Some older blokes struggled, and we'll get to that later on. Jason, 100 well, goals or not? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I'd love to see it, though, Jerry. Don't worry about that. Uh, I agree with Kingy. Great to see the kids. How good was it, though, to see the two biggest names in the game back with a vengeance? I speak of Gary Ablett and Buddy Franklin doing what they do best. Looking forward to the Lions roar, Brownie? Yes, looking forward to the Lions roar. I'm looking forward to see our first 100 goal kicker since Buddy Franklin. I think it'll happen this year, Jared. And the big upsets. How good were some big upsets? Geelong was an upset today against the Premiers, of course, but Sydney and the, uh, the Bulldogs, you could almost call it upset, certainly the margin, that's for sure. So, great footy. It was a great start to the season and uh, we're looking forward to a big show. <laughs> well, it was an epic battle at the MCG today. Uh, old sparring partners Geelong and Hawthorne went head-to-head. -head. It was a great uh, result for the Cats. Uh, uh, Luke Hodge was going to be our special guest, but uh, unfortunately, Jason, he's uh, fallen over with a potential broken arm. Yeah, which is something that the Hawks can ill afford, given their long injury list. But one of those injured players, and a rather big name, is going to be his replacement, Jared. Yes, uh, Jared Ruffhead, uh, the Coleman medalist of 2013. And uh, this is a savage bloke, King, when you consider they've got the Eagles next week and the injury list is starting to grow. Well... He's an organiser, Jared. He controls the troops, he marshals them, he raises the standards with some of his efforts and you just can't replace a player like that. That's why they're, they're so good for the, for the team. We talk about structure so often and, and particularly under Alistair Clarks and one goes in, one comes out. But when enough of your core senior players, mm. the genuine cream, go down, so you've, got, you've lost Roughhead, you've lost Shields, you've lost Hill, you've now lost Hodge, mm. it starts to cut deep, Jared. You may have picked up that I was pretty happy with round one. I reckon for the last five years <laughs> I've been really concerned about the direction of the game. Congestion has been, I think, strangling it, killing it. Not hard. To, it's very difficult to sell a game when it ball doesn't move. Well, here's some congestion that no one's going to be worried about on the weekend. <laughs> there were full houses everywhere, every part of the globe. There were queues back in the uh, pie stand. There was fantastic scenes in Adelaide, in Perth. Trying to get into the MCG today was uh, the congestion we want. The, game, the game's delivered, hasn't it? Yep. I think there was some growing excitement over the pre-season with the new rules uh, that was going to lead to this high-scoring nature and less congestion. And it, it's backed it up. Round one, round one has followed suit, and it looks like it'll continue looking at the numbers. I'll ask you uh, shortly um, what you think has been the major cause for the change. But, Kingy, you're the uh, club accountant. Take us uh, through the audit. Well, let's have a look at what has actually changed. And scoring's gone up. 26, 2015 was 86.4. That's up to 97. So nearly everyone will be in that 100-point uh, mark chase, which is fantastic. Less stoppages. The game doesn't stop and become more organised by the coaches. We'd, we've dropped a dozen of those. We've got more inside 50 opportunities for each team, eight per game, which is great for the scoring and great for the forwards, the high-marking forwards that you want to bring back. And forward half. The game's probably more of a territory game now. Every team's pretty much following suit, trying to lock the ball in their forward half. But the scoring to jump 10 points... Yeah. Almost off the bat of what we've seen from the, the Alistair Clarks and Mould, I think, is where it's come from. He's fantastic. Lack of stoppages also uh, yeah. was pivotal. And there was an outright of the uh, St Kilda-Port Adelaide game. That a 92, I think, yeah. but uh, the yeah. average is getting around the 50. That is just fantastic for footy. It'll be interesting to see, though, whether it impacts on clubs like Fremantle, who are great scorers away from stoppage. But you could see the impact of the rules. There was a classic example at the MCG with players trying to uh, keep the yep. ball in here. You can see the GWS boys, Jack Steele there and uh, Kelly. 
They would, yes, they last year have taken that over, but there was a great goal as a result of it. It cost them a goal. This is fantastic. I think we'll see more of this. Look at Sam Jacobs. He wants to be taken out of bounds by Robbie Tarrant there, but Tarrant says, no, I'm going to pull you back in. You've got nowhere else to go. Got a free kick, kick the goal. Same thing here over at uh, the Port Adelaide game. Their pressure was enormous, yeah. but they just can't. There's no relief anymore taking the ball wide. Well, that's the thing I was noticed. We'll turn you. If you look at the actual inside 50 tackling numbers, Key, mm. it was quite, it was amazing. There were some really high numbers. The, the tackling pressure across the board was fanatical, wasn't it, yep. in uh, in round one? And good to see that uh, Alistair Clarkson was the one that came up with it last year that said, all they need to do is just tighten up the deliberate out of bounds. And it's worked a treat with the players because as players, we're all trained to get the ball out of bounds yeah. as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to get your structure back. How do you get structure back from a stoppage? So, great move. Jason, uh, to what do we attribute the great change? And it is only round one, but we've seen it through the NAB Challenge as well. They've had rule changes. We've had a cap on the rotations. And we've had everybody, it seems, with maybe one or two exceptions, try to emulate the Hawthorne style. Well, look, to be brutally honest, I think we've got to take our hats off to the AFL. I think the rules that they have implemented have definitely worked. And then you see a natural copying of what the best teams are doing. And this has been assisted by the 10-metre uh, protected area, has mm. allowed teams to play the Hawthorne style. And you're having a look, there's five coaches that were direct assistants under Alistair Clarkson, and then a couple that were assistants under his assistants yeah. that have now coached. <laughs> so he's building a big family of AFL <laughs> coaches, isn't he? Kingy, I thought Jake Niles summed it up pretty well over the weekend. He said Hawthorne's main contribution to equalisation is Alistair Clarkson <laughs> coaching up assistant coaches who then go to other clubs. You could just see how quickly Brendan Bolton has impacted on the Blues and the way they are building an attack through their defence. Ball movement's the key. In creating space, getting the game back into flow, not looking for stop stoppages, not seeking to defend almost instantly. Uh, ball movement's gone crazy through the competition. We, we could have actually hard. gone another level. Um, Fremantle have recruited Brent Guerra and David Hale to get yep. uh, some IP. And the Bulldogs... They've picked up a Craig Jennings, who's an analyst um, involved in their footy department, who spent all of last year with Luke Beveridge. Just for strategic planning. I think it's a fantastic uh, model, the Hawthorne model, and that's what that's going to happen, Jason. It hasn't paid off for Freo yet, Jared. But we should <laughs> say that I think Luke Beveridge has taken it to an even you know, higher level yeah, in terms of his ball movement. They were so good to watch. Speaking of which... Oh. Paddy Dangerfield. I think the whole footy world tuned in to uh, see Paddy Dangerfield. If you could just excuse him for a couple of errant shots at goal, he put on a master class of winning the ball. Chase, they said all week it was not about one man. Yep. That was hard to... It was today. It was hard to, <laughs> hard to watch today if you didn't believe that. 44 dis or 43 disposals, 10 inside 50s. Look at that mark. Just yeah. when the moments arrived, he was there, wasn't yeah. he? And the other thing is there's never been a better time to be a quality on baller because you don't get tagged now. Mm. So the best on ballers go head to head, they play wide of each other, they have their 30, 35, 40 touches. Yeah. I mean, he had 43 today, could have kicked three or four goals, missed a couple of absolute sodas, hit the post with a snap. Uh, he's going, I think he, he might be a reasonable recruit for the Cats. He had too. 830 metres gained. The yeah. average game's about 300. So it just shows you the quality. He's 0 to 100 out of stoppages. Yeah. Is clearly the best we've seen since Chris Jones. They're different players, but they're the same numbers that uh, Matt Pritter said. I think he was at 29 at the halfway, so he'd be disappointed he didn't get a record. At half time, I think you could have tossed the coin, though, Brownie, between whether it was Paddy Dangerfield or Zach Smith, who they picked mm. up for picks mm. 41 and 44. It's the greatest uh, bargain of all time. He absolutely dominated as well. Yeah, he didn't. Forward line tackles, two tackles inside 50 there from the big ruckman to kick a couple of goals. He ended up with three goals. He was terrific. Now, when he burst onto the scene, Zach Smith, he did play for Australia in the in the international series. He had big raps on him. Oh, they said he was the next big thing. And Tom Nichols uh, went ahead of him yep. up in the Gold Coast last year. Lost his way after a knee injury, Jarrett. Uh, but he certainly bounced back. He looks like he's rejuvenated down there. He was fantastic. And look, Geelong have fixed their major glaring problem. Look like they've fixed it in the midfield. They've obviously got Dangerfield in. They've sorted out a first ruckman. They're going to get their contested footy back. They've got a tremendous midfield now because you've still got the natural progression of Mitch Duncan, Josh Caddy, yeah. Guthrie to a lesser extent. Um, so uh, exciting times ahead for Geelong. Yeah, it sets it up for a great uh, season. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing whether the Kenneth Curse is back <laughs> in action. <laughs> Love to have a uh, review of the round table, King, and people's <laughs> predictions on the Bulldogs because oh, no. didn't they put on a great show? I think we're changing our opinion on them almost instantly. I didn't even have them in the eighth. And you watch them mm. yesterday. You were that game, Jason. Their pressure was game. unbelievable. It's the best I've seen. I mean, they, they smashed Frio uh, when they had the ball yeah. and then they smashed Frio when they didn't have the ball. Mm. And that was the most impressive thing, to actually assault the opposition 
take away time and space. And the quality of the tackling, first rate. Where do you see them? Uh, I see them very high now. <laughs> I had them... Look, I didn't have them in my top four, I'll be brutally right. honest. But and, and we sit here and we say, don't get carried away with an ad challenge. We shouldn't get carried away with one performance either because Frio were dreadful. Mm. But if that's a sample of what they're trying to achieve, mm. the skill level, the ability to run and carry, the speed, the leg speed, as well as ball speed, and they've got youngsters like Dunkley... Uh, there are a number of others, yeah, that, uh, that just Mate, came in. Uh, oh, I yeah. loved a couple of them. And, and they just played their role. If your back line has two or three poor ball users now, you can't compete. Yep. I think that the West Coast They've gone the other way. They're all good down back. They're all good. They're, they're West Coast Eagles model of last year, aren't they? Undersized ball users. They may lose a couple of one-on-ones here and there defensively. But yeah. on the way out, they just slice. Well, they had Johannesson, they had Murphy, they had Biggs, all having 30, mm. 35 plus. Um, from half back and just dominated. We, and we, have a look at the pressure gauge. Yeah. I mean, 220 is the average is about 180. Mm. It's off the charts. In the competition, that's over the top. This is the first quarter when it was seven goals to nothing. We also talk about uh, interstate sides having great home ground advantages yep. like Perth, yep. uh, the two Perth sides. But I think the Western Bulldogs have got as big a home ground advantage is, as yeah. anyone in the competition. It suits their game style really well. They do play the first seven games of the year at Etihad Stadium. So they've got a really good chance to start the season off with a bang and get a long way out in front. Yeah, they're looking good. Uh, mm. The pressure goes, though. Plus 10 guarantees you a win. Mm. They were plus 48. Yeah. And Ross Lyon uh, didn't leave himself out of the equation either in his post-match. They were up for a street fight, really, and and we were out for a nice Sunday stroll, and we, we got what we deserved. So um, we always win and lose, so I take responsibility. There must have been something in the preparation that allowed our players to present with a mindset and an inability to work. Yeah, he knows they were very, very poor, Ross Lyon. One of the things I found extremely interesting was the defensive strategy that they employed. And this was late in the first term when they're getting hammered. And we're going to show you a couple of players here setting up. It's Cameron Sutcliffe who's picking up Caleb Daniel at half-back. So this is the back of the square. The Bulldogs are kicking to the top of screen. The ball's bounced. Sutcliffe goes back to be that extra. The ball comes forward out of the stoppage straight to Caleb Daniel. Now you've got to weigh up that debate about having the extra back deep mm. to give your, your defence a little bit of support and, and conceding control of the football to the opposition. It's just that mindset. Mm. And I, I think we're going to see a few different things tried because if there's going to be heavy scoring and fast movement of the footy, all of a sudden some of the defensive strategies, I think, are going to get tested. So what you're saying is David Hale and Brink were under a bit of pressure <laughs> uh, early <laughs> in the season. Well, you mentioned uh, Caleb Daniel. We uh, spoke about him uh, glowing last week. Uh, he, along with Wiedering, Oliver... Parrish, Shackey, Dunkley, mm. McLean. It's going to be a tough one to pick. Uh, Brown, are you giving your rising star for the weekend? Josh Shackey, for sure. <laughs> oh, oh, big no. key for Who's he play for? No. No. No, actually, I was lucky enough to see Darcy Parrish. It was pretty impressive uh, for Essendon. But uh, yeah, I love young Oliver from mm. Albany. He just looks tough. Amazing. He's yeah. got a bit of the strawberry blonde of Michael Voss haircut about him. And uh, tell you what, if he's half as good as Voss, he'll be all right. Collingwood were terrible, Kingy. How much uh, of an excuse would you give them for uh, what preceded them in the press the earlier day? Well, Buck said none. He was pretty honest about it. They yeah. were assaulted in the midfield, Jared. And we, all we've heard about is the Collingwood midfield going to take control of the competition. Centre bounces where the game is at its purest. You're six on six in your forward line, six on six in your back line. And the ability for your midfielders to get the advantage is huge. They won the centre clearances convincingly in the second and third terms. 12 to 4, and they put it on the scoreboard. Kurt Tippett was fantastic with his hitouts to advantage, and they just dominated the scoreboard. They just couldn't compete, uh, the Magpies. It's been a problem for them over the yep. last mm. 12 to 18 months. It hasn't improved. And it hasn't improved, mm. and until they get this right, they're going nowhere. Look and at that. Have a look Six at that. goals, two Six to one two. behind. And they're, they're gimme, gimme scores, yep. if you like. You reset, yep. everyone gets a chance to, to start again. There's, there's no real system or ball movement patterns involved in this. This is just get it forward and go. And I, I thought the uh, the Swans were brilliant. Josh Kennedy, eight clearances himself out of the centre. was unbelievable. I saw Kieran Jack talking to the boys. And often uh, it's a facade and it's hard to read anything into it. But we had Jared McVeigh in here last week. Uh, Ed Kieran Jack, his game was fantastic. And uh, their leadership, you could see it in his eyes. They meant uh, business. It was great to have footy back at the SCG. Brownie, Travis Cloak's a growing problem. He is a growing problem. You've actually looked at his stats over the last seven weeks, not only on the weekend. Uh, the weekend he didn't have a touch at all. He was thrown into the ruck after half time. That's how bad he's gone. But have a look at these last seven games. That's concerning. The main one is contested marks, OK? So you'd like to see Travis Cloak should at least 
be averaging two contested marks a game, sometimes up to three. He's only taken the one and and he's gone five of those games without mm. actually taking contested mark. I see Travis Cloak's problem as uh, he, he's not physical enough for these men. I've looked at some of his stuff extensively on tape and for a big man, he's not aggressive enough for these opponents. So he needs to get to work on him. Uh, he needs to spend some more time inside 50. That's for sure. He, he seems to be spending a long mm. time up the ground. And now Travis Cloak is just part of the Collingwood forward line. They don't to make it all about Travis Cloak yeah. and just bomb it long. So I can see he's trying to play a few different positions. You wouldn't want to play there on the weekend. Though. You wouldn't want to play there. Very difficult on the weekend. His midfield let him down, that's for sure. But you like to see him get more physical, his man, and get inside 50 a little bit more and work your man over inside 50 instead of trying to work him over up the field all the time in right. a running race. I saw another big key forward on the weekend that didn't have much of the footy but had a huge impact, Jared. And I'm talking about Drew Petrie yep. from the North Melbourne Football Club. His ability to compete one out against two, three, and sometimes four. I think he had nine possessions. And I was really pleased that post-game, Brad Scott singled him out for a little bit of praise. Because you don't get stats for these. You don't often get the kudos. And a lot of the time, you get overlooked. But he created contests when he had no right to actually even bring the ball to ground. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that he got a bit of credit for that. I thought early season last year, he looked as if he was on the cusp, yeah. but he started yeah. really well. I know you follow them closely, David. Uh, they need Drew Petrie for another year or three to see if they can grab that flag. Well, he's almost on the 300-game uh, barrier, I think. Mm. 13 times he was targeted inside 50, only marked it twice, but yeah. created a great chop of ball. Mm. The other player I want to talk about is Alex Rance. I know mm. we talk about Alex a lot, but what he is to Richmond, I think that he's, mm. he's the best intercept player in the competition. He does not make a poor decision. When he decides to leave his man... He gets it right every time. And I think his improvement is, is understated. Here he is here on Levi Casbol. Carlton with the boy of the middle. He guards the leading lane. There's a Carlton player leading straight to the goal square there. He cuts that off. They don't go there. Diffuses that problem. And then he gets back first, resets, and gets possession. And away they go again. This is when they're under siege. Yep. You know, Carlton had 57 inside 50s for the game. It was a massive number. And here he is there on a, on a mid-sized player, on Andrew Walker. He allows him to dictate terms, but... He never guards him wide. He stays involved, vision on both the player and the ball coming down and makes the decision to leave, gets possession again. Yeah. I think he's a, he's a freak defender. I think what he, he's got really good footwork, King, and this is something he didn't have early on in his career. He's got really good footwork and then when he does have the ball, he plays within his limitations. And early days, he was a pretty ordinary kick, so he's very safe. He's but gradually, he's getting more and more confident with his kicking to mm. be where it's becoming a real offensive weapon for Richmond, I believe, and I, they need it because sometimes they can go too slow out of defence. I think they need to tag him, Jared. If you're playing against Richmond, you need to assign a player just to negate and annoy Alex Rance. Won't happen. Friday night is more than likely to be Cloak Fee Rance. Well, there you go. Who wins? At the moment on form, you'd go with Alex <laughs> well, Rance. I think if you had Cloak just trying to take him out of the way, trying to take him out of the play, hard to do, I understand mm. that, or just competing with him so that he doesn't intercept the ball, you'd be mm. a chance. We might get some advice from our next guest for Travis Cloak as to how he should play. Because Jared Ruffhead is coming up. We're also talking Gary Ablett, Buddy Franklin's back in town, along with Jacob Wiedering, and of course Stevie J and the West, uh, the Grand, uh, Greater Western Sydney Giants. Come on, Ruff, indeed, particularly for those of us who had a small interest in Cyril Rioli for the Norm Smith medal. We were to have Luke Hodge uh, in the studio, but uh, he has got a suspected broken arm, and uh, his great mate, Jared Ruffhead, has been uh, on short notice. Good enough to join us on the couch to talk about uh, not just what happened today, but uh, life in general as a Hawthorne Premiership star. Welcome to you, Jared. Thank you very much for having me. How did you see uh, today's uh, events unfold? Oh, look, it wasn't great uh, being in the box and watching... Uh, from the sidelines, it's only the seventh game I've missed in the last four or five years. So, a little bit different, but uh, you can't expect to win a game on a pretty much a quarter of good footy by Hawthorne. So, Geelong were, were very, very good today and deserve to win. You've got some injuries. Uh, what's your own circumstances? Yeah, so I'm seven weeks uh, tomorrow post-surgery after 
uh, the procedure with my knee and, and uh, I haven't started running or anything yet but everything's going along as planned and hopefully uh, get going in the next couple of weeks. We believe Hodgie's uh, got a crack so he's our four to six. Uh, Liam Shields obviously uh, a big loss for you, ball mover. <laughs> And uh, I guess there's two or three others like Brad Hill that uh, are unknown. Yeah, that's right. A bit unfortunate at the start of the season to, you know, get a couple of injuries, as you said there. But um, gives blokes an opportunity to come in, and, and I suppose that's what's been a strength of ours the last few years is we've been able to uh, bat pretty deep, and uh, it's going to be tested in the next few weeks. Hey, Ruffy, how has Alistair Clarkson approached your four, four Pete or four Thorn, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, did he address at the start of pre-season? Has it been an ongoing theme throughout pre-season or he just hasn't touched it at all? No, nothing's, nothing's been said, Brownie, I guess. Uh, last year, nothing was said and, and this year it's pretty much uh, a new group and you know we've had a couple of blokes retire and, and move on and um, with suckers going as well, I guess there's you know, an opportunity for three blokes. And with the, the six injuries today, there's, there's six spots that opened up going into today's game. So you can't really focus on the four Peter whatever you guys are talking about in the media, I guess. You would have had a bird's eye view of what looked to be uh, an ineffective forward line for three quarters of the match today, apart from the third quarter. And it was almost cast your mind back to post-2008 grand final when Geelong had that great run. They used to intercept mark everything that came inside the attacking 50 for Hawthorne. That happened again today, particularly in the first half. Must be some concerns there. I think it's just the, the fact that we went inside 50 suiting those type of plays. You know, if you bomb it long to Harry Taylor, he's probably going to beat yeah. his opponent nine times out of ten. So if you can create that uh, spot on the ground where you've got the double threat in terms of being able to hit a lead up or being able to go over the back, then it can put some um, indecision into the defender's mind. Whereas at the moment, um, you know, if you're just watching bombing it in as a midfielder, then it makes life a lot easier for a, a key defender. How do you see yourself as a player? I mean, you've been an elite midfielder now in the competition, an elite forward. You, you play different roles for Alistair Clark, so it's depending, it's Clarkson, depending on what's required. How do you see yourself as a player? Um, oh, I think I'm a footballer. I don't think I'm an athlete. So uh, I guess I, I back myself in to read the game pretty well and, and uh, I guess playing... Uh, different sports as a kid has been able to help me play the footy that you play today. You didn't play midfield as a junior, did you? No. Nah, At nah, all? No. Nah, nah. I was mainly a, a forward with a, a little bit of defence, but as I said, playing basketball as a kid, it helps you to uh, hand-eye coordination and I guess that uh, yeah, m movement in the midfield. You've uh, had a PCL operation. It's not the big one, but uh, it's an unusual operation for footballers. Uh, they don't normally go down that uh, procedure, but you're one of two or three bigger guys that uh, have had it done. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, being a bit bigger and having the stress go through the knee uh, makes it a little bit harder to, for it to, I suppose, heal. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, it just it flared up in the in the preseason, and they've gone the the traditional, or well, not the traditional, but the the yep. PCL reconstruction this time. Hey, Ruffy, it's been an amazing story at Hawthorne the way you have been able to handle injuries, handle adversity, and certainly you've had a lot of older players. Still playing very good footy well into their 30s. I know you're not in your 30s yet, but um, as far as yeah, their fitness program and the way they prepare in the off-season, yeah, over the pre-season, do the players have a big input along with Andrew Russell into their own program and the way they condition themselves to get ready for the season? Oh, each to their own, I reckon, Brownie. I mean, uh, Sean Burgoyne came across with his knee injury and was only said that you know he's probably got two or three years of footy left in him. So the the connection that him and Jack have had. Uh, being able to work out his program is has been different to someone like Sam Mitchell, who was who would like to do every session and and is you know normally first out there and last to get off the track. So um, as you were saying, probably different for each individual. As and as you are getting older, you probably need that because sometimes you can freshen a bloke up in pre-season by not giving him as much and only just. Um, giving him what he needs to do, I guess, because these guys have been going around for 14, 15 years. They know their body pretty well and know what they need to do to get out there. Mm. For those at home that are wondering who Jack is, Ruffy, that's Andrew Russell, the fitness and conditioning <laughs> guru down at Hawthorne. But it's interesting, I was, uh, I, was, I was keen to ask Hodgie if he had have come in before he got injured because he was asked recently about his age and he actually bristled up. Mm. He started to get a little bit mm. uh, tetchy about it yeah. because we have got a few players, the Hawks, in, you know, into their 30s and moving on. How long can they go on for? Is there enough youth and quality in terms of the class of young players coming through to take up that slack if and when they do go? Oh, for sure. I, I said it at the start. Our, our, our depth's been our strength the last few years. It's, you know, ideally, you'd love that for everyone to get a medal that's played that year instead of just the 22 on grand yeah. final day. But um, you say how long these guys can keep going. I guess you know, 30 was 
um, the age where people just got a line straight through them and thought, you know, these, that they're done and whatnot. But we were able to recruit Lake here, I think, at 30. So he came in and, and did his job for three years. And, and these guys are still continually to improve. You look at Mitch. Um, he's still getting better and better, and it, you know, someone said he's 34 this year, and you wouldn't. <laughs> the way that he acts around the footy club too, you wouldn't definitely think that he is 34 <laughs> years old. <laughs> You're a senior player uh, in the competition now, and I'd like your thoughts on the big issue of the week, and that's the illicit drugs policy. I was a major supporter of the illicit drugs policy when it first when it first came out, but uh, I think it's probably had its day. I think we almost need to go back to a contract-based policy where you can do whatever you like in your off-season. But one of the requirements, and you sign a contract to say you will do this, is that you turn up and you don't have illicit drugs in your system. Can I ask you as an 18-year-old, if you were drafted and they said, here's a contract for $400,000 a year for three years, all you've got to do is turn up and do your best, but don't drink and drive and don't take illegal drugs, would you sign it? Oh, it's easy to, to, to say as an 18-year-old kid, you know, to put that in front of them. You, you, you would de definitely say yes, but I think w what we have to understand is it is a new policy. We're, we're getting used to it, and you got to remember we are the only code that release our stats and what mm. goes on with this. So no one else, no other league in the country, no other code is, is releasing what goes on. So you got to remember if we're the only one doing that, then of course we're the only ones who are going to get scrutinised and yep. everything is going to be written about us if that's the case. So we've still got to remember that. I think it's really important that the players do drive this issue. Do you believe? that the players are taking enough responsibility for it? Oh, I, I think so, yes. I mean, as I said, the, the old code probably needed to be changed, and it has, and uh, I'll say it again, we've got to remember that this is the first year that we've had it in, so um, it's still things probably need to be ironed out, but we've got to remember it is new. What do you think of uh, Nick Maxwell's comments? Uh, for those, if you haven't heard them, this is what he had to say on SCN Radio. Probably going back about a month when I started to hear rumblings myself, I started doing some digging and I spoke to a lot of players from different clubs. Now players are just, they're basically having a laugh in the off-season because um, they've got their six or eight weeks and they know that they can go and do what they want to do. And the only, the only result of that is that when they get back and their hair tested, they've got to sit down with the doctor and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. There's a lot of players that I've spoken to who have said that it's just not working. Now he's a premiership captain of not that long ago and still working uh, with the GWS. Yeah, it's interesting comments. I mean, um, you've got guys that are well-respected like Nick Maxwell, who's a premiership skipper, saying that. Um, it's interesting to hear those comments, but, I mean, it's just one person at the end of the day too. So I still think we've got to remember that this is a new code and we're still working our way through it as players. Ruffy, did it have an effect on the players when... Uh, Lockie Keefe and Josh Thomas were suspended for a couple of years because they took illicit substance and, and it was laced with performance enhancing drugs. Did, did the players in the competition, especially the players in Hawthorne, sit up and take notice of that? Because it, it seems beyond comprehension to me that Collingwood have got a, you know, a, a reasonable number of players that have seemed to have tested positive or, or it's reported they tested positive with illicit substance over the off-season. And it was their own teammates that were suspended for two years on the back of that. Did players really take notice of it or, or it was sort of just... I definitely think it's something... It does put a scare through the whole competition because it, it is real and it makes it even more so real that something like these players can get, can get suspended. And, and, you know, for so many years it was only hearsay and not much went on, whereas you do finally see that these boys are, are getting years suspension, it puts it in the forefront of your mind that it is happening in the here and now. Would you know what's happening with your teammates? I mean, we're, we're suggesting that there are things going on at every single club. We're not singling out one club and we're only talking hypothetically, but as a player, would you know what most of your teammates are up to, particularly in the off-season? Well, not really. I guess, <laughs> you know, you've got eight weeks off. I'm just turned 29 and some of these kids are 17, yeah. 18 coming in. It's very yeah. hard to... So there's a generational gap, isn't there? Oh, for sure. And that, I'm starting to realise that the most this year, probably of any, of any year, because um, we are getting older and these kids are still younger. I think, you know, a lot of these kids are born in 97, 98 that are coming in these days. I've, I was 10, 11 when they were born. So um, having that uh, connection with them is tough and it's, you know, I don't think they'd like to be seen out with a... 29, 30 year old <laughs> on the weekend as well. You know, it might be a bit it might be like the older brother looking after the younger brother in a sense. So it is hard, but I guess, you know, they're, they're in, they've had their break and, and you know, they, it's hard to keep tabs on what everyone does in the break because you do want to have a, have a rest and a relax your mind. Jared, I want to talk to you about uh, some other dinosaurs in football, and that is uh, full forwards. 
or any forwarder for that matter who can kick 100 goals. I found myself uh, thinking maybe we can get our greatest asset back, like a Dunstall who drags people through the gate. You could have been one yourself. Brownie didn't quite get there, played centre-half forward. But to see Josh Kennedy kick 100 goals, I thought mm. to myself, maybe the dodo is going to come back. Don't take that uh, personally, uh, Jason. Uh, I asked Brandon to do some stats uh, on this uh, from the last time somebody kicked uh, 100 goals, which yeah. was uh, Buddy Frank. I see you yeah. put yourself in there, Brownie, oh, in 07. Brandy. That's very good. He had to go back start. far yeah. enough. Had to go back <laughs> one further. Stop it. Do you think it's possible that uh, we're going to uh, see a, re a revision to perhaps a Josh Kennedy who can kick nearly 100 goals, or even 100? Uh, after round one uh, and seeing some of the scores of some of the sides, I yeah. guess... I guess there's always that chance, but as a footy supporter and, and one that you know, has watched footy and seen guys kick 100, and I remember that last time when Bud did kick 100, that was one of the, the more better things in footy, seeing you know, some of my mates from back home have run on the ground and managed to find you in the middle yep. of Eddie Had Stadium when Bud kicked 100. So stuff like that is pretty cool in footy. We think that there's been a shift. Well, these boys won't sign onto it just yet. From the key forward, who's been the 197, 198 centimetre giant that we've seen in the past 10 years, maybe moving to the hybrid type, like a Jake Stringer, that next level down, Gunston, Bruce, Bruce at your club. Jake Stringer versus Jesse Hogan, where do you sit? We're asking everyone that comes on the couch oh. this year. Take one. Did you really? Yes. Mm. We'd like to That's have a little bit of vision of these, of these players. I've watched them both on the weekend. So right. I saw both games. Well, there's three um, reasons why string is so difficult to match up on. He can, he can do this, Chase. You're yep. in the game. The, the unbelievable. I think this is the number one asset for me. You just can't tackle him. You can't mm. stop this guy. His desire to take possession at pace and burst through is unsurpassed. Does this does he remind you of Gary, Gary Ablett Senior, Jace? He does a bit, doesn't he? Because he's capable of doing just about anything. And he'll take them on at ground level. He'll take them on in the air. Very good on the lead, and he, he's got a fair roost on him, kicking-wise as well. But the other bloke that you mentioned, Jesse Hogan, is more your traditional type that you can build a, a forward structure around. He's not a bad player either, are he? <laughs> no, and both have got the confidence now that they've played a couple of years, and they're starting to really feel like they can dominate games, which both have proved. You know, Jesse Hogan was a bit quiet for three quarters and then kicks three in the last mm. quarter on the weekend. Stringer kicks five. So, you know, these kids at 20, 21 years old are coming in and, and having a real... Big presence in games already. The yes, thing, I'm, like, the no, thing yes. I'm excited about uh, with, with Jesse Hogan, <laughs> especially, he looks like he's got the smarts uh, now to play key forward. Uh, especially, we've got a bit of vision here on the weekend. He probably got touched up by Phil Davis for three quarters, but had a had a really a match-winning last quarter where he did kick three goals. You see here, he's on March Bank here. This is in the last quarter. And you wonder how that happened. Well, Jesse Hogan was playing on Phil Davis for most of the game. Jack Watts is on March Bank. And you just see here, they're working together. They're, this is obviously a ploy by the guys. Maybe we can talk a bit through this at the end of it, uh, Ruffy. Um, they're obviously trying to get a mismatch here. They keep working at it. Jack Watts crosses over here, gets Phil Davis. All of a sudden, March Bank is stuck on Hogan. You see that release. So Hogan separates for the next minute or so in play, they stayed apart from each other and they couldn't get the matchup back on. And then we saw Hogan took that mark about a minute later that we showed. Just that relationship stuff and the smarts of keeping yourself in a game of football and trying to get a mismatch, Ruffy. Yeah, that's a big thing, I guess. Um, you know, yourself and Daniel Bradshaw probably used to do it back in the day. I was lucky enough to do it with Bud, and, and now you do it with Gunson and even other blokes. You look at Piopolo, who's probably one of the best to play with because yeah. he will just sacrifice and come in and block an opponent so you can get a lick of the ice cream, in a sense, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, and the more you play with each other, the more that, that just becomes natural. And, you know, Jesse Hogan, this, this is only his, you know, 23rd, yep. 24th yeah. game of footy. So the more that he plays with Jack Watts and these guys, the more that that will just become natural to these blokes and the more mismatches he'll get, I guess. Well, it's been an amazing uh, performance by you, Jared. You've had three minutes to answer the question yes. and you've uh, done nothing. Right. Uh, Stringer four at the moment, Hogan two. <laughs> Give us a vote because we've got to say goodbye. I'll go with Stringer. You're oh. going with Stringer. Oh. That makes it oh. Jared, we're looking forward to seeing you uh, back in action uh, about midway through the season. Uh, thanks for coming in and filling in for... Yeah, Skipper Luke Hodge, uh, and good luck for the year. Thanks for having me, boys. Thanks, Ruffy. Cheers. Jared Ruffhead, uh, one of the stars of the competition. Don't go away. We've got plenty more to come. The great man is back for the, the Gold Coast Suns, and didn't he uh, turn it on? And Kingy has a look at the GWS, or is it the Globetrotters?
Well, it was an unusual round one because we welcome back, as usual, a, a brilliant crop of youngsters. But uh, unusually, we welcome back some of the biggest names in the game have been absent for a period of time. Most notably, of course, Gary Ablett. How good was it? <laughs> it was Just to see the little master back in action, doing what he does best, mm. getting it in the middle of the ground. This is this is fantastic. He, he's, an, he's involved initially, and then he just says, OK, we've got possession. I need to find a little bit of space here because I know it'll end up in my hands. <laughs> and then he gets the opportunity to make something happen. And can he make it happen? Mm. Again, a little bit of space. I love the acceleration, oh, yeah. almost off a standing start there. And when in doubt, do it yourself, Gaz. He's a freak. I love it. There was a real buzz around the stadium up there yeah. the other day, looking forward to Ablett's return. His returns in round one games have been fantastic. I think there's a bit of a buzz around the Gold Coast Suns. They, they weren't playing anyone on the weekend, of course. We know Essendon's going to battle to win a game this year, but there's a fair bit of excitement around the Suns. If they knock off Frio, even with Sandy back, uh, then mm. they'll really get jumping. Buddy Franklin back, along with the Ford Pocket Plumber, Kingy. Ford Pocket Plumber, Papley. Tommy Papley, it was fantastic, Jared. I think that uh, they found one there. But isn't it great for football to see this man thriving again? Yep. Um, he looks happy. He looks as fit as you've ever seen him. And his commanding presence inside that Ford 50, it just sent jitters into the Collingwood back six. They didn't know what to do. They were rattled. They, were, they all spectated for most of the night at just what this man was doing. Yeah, and if you're going to talk about 100, who's to say he's not the man that'll come back yeah. and do it? Because he has more shots than everyone well, I think, else. I think there's three guys. I think it's Kennedy, Franklin and probably Jake Stringer that couldn't Str make 100. Stringer? He could make, he could make 100. Well, I, I, I haven't jumped from Hogan. Well, make that six, make Kingy. That's six. That's that's six. six. Oh, no, no. no, he's still no, 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 no. He's jumped that's ship. Yeah, Boomer Harvey, the youngest 40-year-old in the business. Don't ever underestimate how important his impact was in that win over the Adelaide Crows because in the third term, Boomer said we need something, so I better come up with three goals. <laughs> now, he just knows when to run forward. I mean, you can say, look, they're the easy ones over the top running forward. This is the but one. it's the nows and, and knowing when to do it and also knowing when to take the responsibility of kicking the goal rather than centering the ball here. He's a beautiful kick of the footy. Four, he backed himself. 410 games, Jason. Yep. He's still doing it. The Crows led by 19 points, mm. just short of this seven-minute burst that uh, the Kangaroos put on. And it wasn't just Boomer. I know Boomer's on the end of these, and he does the finishing. It was Cunnington, it was Goldstein, mm. Waite, Zeeble. They lifted. And yep. for the first time, it wasn't Wells or Harvey exclusively. I think the Kangaroos turned the corner a little Good bit. Good advertisement for his drink. Yeah, the spark. spark. Yeah. Certainly uh, had plenty of it at <laughs> half time. Jacob Wiedering, 17 uh, possessions, lots yeah. of intercept marks, and uh, a fine pick up for sure. Well, we've spoken about these young kids, haven't we, and how exciting they all are. And I think Blues fans would be thrilled to know that they've got a 10 year player there that they're going to help build a team around. I think Mark Robinson said that he's the best number one pick from Nick Rewald. And you wouldn't argue against that at the moment. Uh, he's been fantastic. A little early after uh, one might, game? Might be, a, might be a little bit early, but uh, we'll just see here. Look at what that. do you think of a bit of arrogance in your first game, Brownie? You or... know what? I don't mind that. Uh, he's <laughs> he's <laughs> probably going to go a bit further than uh, Sedana <laughs> Setantaro Halpin, who did that to me in about his first oh, game. Hello, oh, yes. Oh, couldn't, oh, no. couldn't understand him in their Irish accent. But <laughs> I don't mind that. Carlton have been walkovers for the last 20 years virtually. And good to see, for, I see Brendan Bolton has come into the joint and said enough's enough. And I don't mind his players following with a bit of bravado. Um, he won't you know, like that. He I, won't like I'm, you know not, I'm not That's... sure about that. I'm not sure. Will he not like that? That's twice now, Jared. We asked him to do the graphic about goal kickers yeah. going back to the last time 100 was kicked, which yep. was Buddy. Yep. He went a year earlier That's to get right. himself in. Yep. Now he's told another story to bring himself back into it. Oh, yeah, here we go. I was <laughs> told by Jerry to bring that in. <laughs> but, uh, no, I'm not sure whether Brendan Bolton would be disappointed in it, King. So that'll be interesting. So I mm. think they're just trying to... Um, change the mentality and change the culture around the joint. That now they want to become winners, and they're better off starting now instead of talking about this rebuild and giving themselves an out for three years. Let's move on to the Eagles. A lot of people have them as their premiership favourites. They would have learned a lot of lessons from the uh, devastating loss in the grand final, and I think this would have uh, been the basis of one of their most severe lessons, and that's to give the option, include your teammate if he's in a much better position. Here's another one. The handball could have gone from Luke Chiu, who it's fair to say was one of their better players uh, for the day. He had a couple of brain fades. But on the weekend, you could see an amazing transformation in this team. They're pretty good at it normally. They were unbelievably good at it, giving the first hands, giving it to the guy in the best position. Not most of the time, every time. 
And, <laughs> and, and, and even Josh Kennedy gave a couple away. He could have ended up with double figures. Yeah, he could have kicked Very 12. Very easily. He'll change his tune if he gets close to kicking 100 goals <laughs> by the back end of the year. <laughs> That's a, always the way, isn't it? Well, I saw the reverse at the MCG. I think the GWS Giants have got the most selfish forward line in the competition, clearly. They were uh, borderline arrogant on the weekend that some of the opportunities they took and burnt their teammates, and it cost them in the end. They kicked 10 goals, 18. Two of those were rushed. So they missed mm. 16 opportunities. There were some set shots in there, mm. but in general play. And it starts at the top. Stevie J's been taken up there to show these guys how to win, not necessarily to kick 50 goals. Here he is getting possession at the goal face, running the wrong way. He's got four or five options, decides to take the snap. And that was early in the game. And it set the trend for these young players. Here he is again here. Look, normally he's a great finisher, we know, but a handball there guarantees the goal. I think they've got to get back to the drawing board and say the team kicks the goal, not the individual. I think it's an issue from last year. I don't think they addressed it well enough last year. It's an issue for Leon Cameron and their group. I mean, these are kids that have been doing this, mm. I think, without making solid rules, and it's uh, haunted them and cost them four points. But, Jared, for me, this reflects the way they play the game. I mean, there's a lot of talented players there, and I really like a lot of the players, but they don't want to play the hard... They don't want to do the hard things to get the job done. They want to play pretty footy. Mm. They want to play that fast, free-flowing, get on the can. end of it. They but can. they don't want to tackle. They're yeah. a poor tackling team. They're a poor pressuring team. They've got to do the hard stuff before they can do the pretty stuff and look good. Certainly the Demons uh, outmuscled them early in the piece, uh, and it was a brilliant victory by them. Before we go to the break, just your thoughts on the illicit drug policy and whether or not you think a contract-based uh, policy could replace it. Oh, I think you're spot on, Jared. The players have to take ownership of this and if they want to take a stand. It's up to them, really. But I think the NFL model is really, really honest and really solid. Uh, if the players transgress, they, they pay a penalty. It's, it's, the sanctions are there for all to see. We know what they're rubbed out for, substance abuse and, and the like. Um, the alcohol's taken into that as well. I like the NFL policy. I would echo the sentiments of uh, Chris Scott on 360. There are experts out there that know what they're talking about. I don't. All I will say is the players need to own it and the players need mm. to drive it. They're the ones that can fix this. The, the problem I have with the clubs wanting to know the players, um, that opens up a can of worms because as soon as you know more than the doctors know at a club, uh, rumours start and, and all yeah, the, the CEOs were talking well, amongst well, themselves. They, they, well, well, how in the hell did the number get out about Collingwood? So someone's obviously talked within that football club that knows the figure. Uh, so the too many rumours start and then all the players get tarred with the same brush. So... Yeah, we're either going to keep it secretive to just the doctor or we go fully open and transparent. After one strike, everyone knows and then the suspensions after start after the second strike. I wouldn't strike. have an illicit policy. I've changed my mind. I go straight back to a contract to play league footy mm. and there's a number of reasons why. It's but, negligent. But, but there's never been a contract, though, to not have illicit drugs. Have we ever had that situation? If you want to play football, you sign the contract, which yep. means you turn up with no drugs in the system. If you have drugs, there's a four-week penalty. There's an eight-week mm. penalty second time. I mean, at the present time, clubs are putting investing massive money mm. in players who want to gamble whether or not their illicit drug yeah, is well, laced well, with well, there are jobs out there where you can't do that, Jerry. Yep. You can't be pilot, truck drivers, yeah. these sorts of things. They're out there. Why, is, why are the players? It so is hard to comprehend because you don't have to. People are not holding a gun to your head saying you have to be an AFL footballer. Go out and be a plumber or a brickies labourer or some other job where you don't have this policy hanging over your head. If you play AFL football, it's not a right; it's a privilege. So you've got to work within the the confines of uh, what the rules are. Well, there's a number of columnists I read over the weekend saying that uh, it is against the civil liberties, that it's too restrictive, you've got no oh, right. And I think they have got a right, the clubs, yeah. to expect you not, not to risk million-dollar sponsorships because you want to dabble over mate, the, your office. Mate, it's it's the civil libertarian, civil, libert civil li libertarians will get on their high horse about anything. Like, so I'm not sure about that sort of stuff. But players drive a hell of a lot of this game. Yeah. They do. Yeah. They put the show on, they yeah. drive a lot of it. They have to buy into anything that you're doing to make it work. If you don't get a contract, Jason, I'm sure there's somebody else who uh, will sign the contract. Yeah, but you'll, never get, you'll never get that over the line, Jerry. You'll never get that through well, collective they're bargaining. Strike. They're going to strike because they want to take a list of drugs. Well, you're, just, you're just going to demand they all sign this type of Jared, contract? That won't work. Jared, Jared, well, the... there's plenty of CEOs out there that think it will work and that's where it's going to go. Jared, no, the... it won't because you've got 700 players that are saying no. The game won't go ahead, Jerry. This you can't is, tell them is, what type of contract they're going to sign. This is sign. not an illicit drugs policy. All it is is if you want to play football... Are you're trying to circumvent the illicit drugs absolutely. policy... Absolutely. I don't, think the, I don't think the illicit drugs policy is the, working. The point is, if the players don't buy into it mm. and drive it, it won't work, and that won't work. Jared, in fairness, like Chris Scott said, all the Olympic sports don't have this illicit drug code. So 
the, the AFL players are putting themselves out there. I understand there. that. I, is it... If it's not changing behaviour, though. And I know we've had some... Uh, we've had a small change. Mm. But we've had two players at Collingwood take laced illicit drugs yeah. and it's cost Collingwood 5% of their list and mm. potentially cost them sponsors down the track. That's not working either. We're going to take a break. I'm sure there'll be more discussion on that down the track. But still to come, Nick Rewald, he plays his 300 on the weekend. And Eddie Betts, where is he playing for the rest of the season? Don't forget, the Lions roar. Looking forward to next week. Uh, our special guest is Don Pike, a bloke who's done an enormous apprenticeship, uh, been around footy for a long, long time. He'll be hurting after the round one lost to the Kangaroos, but uh, he'll be joining us straight after the showdown next week. Um, boys, Eddie Betts is one of his challenges. He was their mainstay forward, and yet uh, just the one goal played a lot further up the ground. Over. Last year he kicked 63 goals, the year before he kicked 51. They're as rare as hen's teeth, Jared. these sorts of players. Mm. He had four disposals on the weekend of his 15 and the forward 50. Now, for me, he's a stay-at-home forward. He's the threat for the Kangaroos. Has been every year. Yeah. He's a difficult matchup. Scotty Thompson has awful trouble uh, trying to clamp him. He's kicked bags of five a couple of times and a bag of four in his last seven occasions against the Kangaroos. So Smart he, bloke's on Pike, though. Is he trying to just get share the workload, share the energy around? They had 57 so. inside 50s, Adelaide, and they just couldn't get it on the scoreboard. Mate, and that's the re he's one of the reasons why. Mate, he didn't need it. Get out of the way. Josh Jenkins kicks five. Big, Josh. big Tex kicks yeah, three. It's all about the big key forwards, 57 mate. 57 inside 50. They needed more, more midgets down there. Oh, Some small sure guys down that. there to get the job done. <laughs> I don't think it's politically correct to use that. <laughs> Adelaide Oval. Little yes. yes. Sort of great game at Adelaide Oval, Josh. Mm. Well, they surprised me, the St Kilda yeah. Football Club. And I think the thing that probably makes the AFL the happiest after round one is the fact that we had teams like Melbourne yep. do well. We had St Kilda do well. We had Carlton almost pull off a win over, uh, Car uh, Richmond. over Richmond. And then for a, a great part of the game, Brisbane were also it's very a lot of positives for Brisbane. But I love the way they worked so hard, St Kilda, when they had the ball, when it was in dispute, they got numbers there and they just put pressure at the coalface. And that's what this game's built around. Do you think that their lack of a second practice match hurt them at the end? I'm not sure, but I loved the attitude of Alan Richardson post-game. He said, really disappointed with the last 15 minutes when mm. they faded out. Yeah. Mm. I love that attitude. It's not getting close is good enough. Being competitive interstate against the supposed heavyweight for three and a half quarters was a good effort. It's... We should have won that. They've got a brand, haven't they? Yep. Their pressure's their brand. Mm. Seven of their nine first-half goals come from forward-half turnovers. They're, they're manic. They're smaller forwards. I'll call them that this time, Jase. Mm. Put on heaps of pressure. It was fantastic. For yeah. 300 games, Nick Rewald has been there, yes. Brand Brownie. And uh, we celebrate a great career on the weekend against the Bulldogs. Well, it's well-deserved, isn't it? He's been an absolute legend in the game and uh, one of my favourite players to watch. And let's hope he can have a good game. Uh, and get through and kick a few goals. That'd be nice to see, Jerry. And he pays tribute uh, to yeah. his sister as well. It has been uh, recognised as the Maddies match. Uh, second round, second try for Jonathan Brown. And I know the Hawks' squawk is coming, but the Lions' roar is about to fire. <laughs> Jeez, I don't, I don't think the Hawks' squawk will have as good a sting as that. But uh, <laughs> now let's have a look at the weekend here. Now, I know there's, there's medical staff that pay a lot of attention to our great players. Let's have a look at Buddy Franklin. Fair enough. Yeah, he's a chance to win the Coleman Cook kick 100 goals. He's got half the Sydney Swans bench all over him there. We've got trainers, we've got doctors, we've got physios. They're all there. And then we look to another man who's very important, equally as important to his team's chances. The tr Alex Trance, the trainer, comes up. Oh, no, not enough. Away he walks. Where is it? Where is all the medical staff? Come on, boys, turn it up. Richmond Medicos, he kept her in the game for three quarters on Thursday night. Paying a little bit more attention. Only a defender, Brownie. You've got to score. Yeah, There's yeah, only true, a Lions true. Cup rule, that one. Well, I haven't got a stinger Come on, for score. my Hawks score, but I just want to say when opportunity <laughs> knocks, be ready. You've got to take it. Sean Hampson playing for Richmond. Mm. Ivan Maric is out. You can see he's playing on Cruiser here. Now, the ball's deep in defence. Carlton have got it. Cruiser leads all the way from half forward, and he doesn't quite make the effort to go and get him. He's always sitting off, sitting off, saying, oh, they won't use him. Well, they do. And it's a poor kick, so he goes, oh, I better go tackle him. Then, oh, he's going to handball it, so I drop off. And then look what happens. You've just got to show desperation when you get that opportunity. We know he's got some, some physical attributes that could make him a very good player. I just thought 
he'd be really disappointed when he looks back at this and say, well, I had an opportunity to have an impact and I just didn't quite go, perhaps, you know, to that extreme that I would have liked. And if you had got a shot of uh, Damien Hardwick in the box afterwards, oh, it wasn't good. I like this walk. Oh. It might have covered the roar uh, Ooh, tonight. Oh. <laughs> what was that? Jeez, oh, I've got no stinger. Jiggy, <laughs> question without notice. If you had one chance to change one of your predictions in the top eight, what would it be? Uh, definitely the dogs in on what we saw on the weekend. Jason? Yeah, they go straight in the top four. I don't need to change, mate. I think I've got oh, spot on. Mr Perfect. <laughs> oh, no. Absolutely spot on. Oh, no. Don't forget, Don Pike is going to be joining us as our special <laughs> guest <laughs> next week on the couch. It's been a long weekend. I hope you had a great Easter. We'll see you next week after round two. Good night. I don't. I don't.